Greetings to you in the name of Jesus. My name is Suresh Ramachandran. I am uh, from Kandy, Sri Lanka and right now this is the 1st of July year 2013 and I am in my office at uh, nearly 11 o'clock p.m. at night to record this message about Babylon. And uh, greetings to you all in the name of Jesus because uh, this is a subject that uh, we really need to study and understand. The reason why I said that this was 1st of July year 2013 is this. Way back in the early, uh, the, the turn of the century, I did a deep teaching on Jezebel. Actually, in year 2006, I held a conference way up in uh, Scotland in a city called Perth where I taught about Jezebel and uh, many people listened to that and many churches witnessed revival and cleansing of the Holy Spirit and the exposure of the real spirit of Jezebel and at that time I said well I'm going to be teaching about Babylon soon. But for the past seven years, I was unable to do that. And I believe there is a spiritual reason as well as other practical reasons. Right after I completed the teaching on Jezebel, I had to go through tumultuous times of persecution and problems. In Sri Lanka, people tried to kill me accused me of uh, destroying statues of other religions and uh, court cases were filed against me and I had to run from one country to another because they were pursuing to kill me and I simply could not keep to my promise that I was going to do a teaching on Babylon. But now, seven years after my teaching on Jezebel, here I am finally recording the teaching on Babylon. So my dear friends, welcome. My teachings are there on YouTube and many television programs and if you are a, a first time viewer of my teaching, please bear with me and uh, I, I would really encourage you to look at other teachings of mine and uh, be blessed. And if you have anything to add to my teaching to let me know or to correct me perhaps, just feel free to keep in touch with me and let me know uh, what changes I should uh, bring. Okay, I live in a country called Sri Lanka, a very beautiful island of uh, the southern tip of India in the Indian Ocean. And here in this country, we get a lot of uh, ancient people. We call them Vaddas. Right now, there are only about 300 of them left. Yeah, not 3,000. 300 of them left and when I see the way they worship they usually worship their deities which are usually their faith is animistic so they worship the sun moon stars and a lot of natural things in the in the jungle waterfalls trees and well you know what animism is all about right they worship nature nature so they worship usually at nights. Do you know how? They light a huge fire and they dance around the fire with heavy drum beats and they have a religious man in charge. And that's how they, they worship. And they keep on chanting something, you know. They, they, they keep on saying one or two words uh, boom, 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 you know, they, they, they do that beat. Now, if you look at the history of the world, Sri Lanka has been a very isolated island. It was called Ceylon. And, uh, well, we have uh, historical facts that many people from many parts of the world came and traded with Ceylon. And this country had a name called uh, Tabrabane and Serendib and uh, even the colonial people were after this country. The Portuguese invaded this country in 1505. 
uh, followed by the Dutch and then in 1791 uh, the British came here until 1948. So Sri Lanka has been a busy island but if you look at the ancient history of the world, the island of Ceylon has not had any real connection with the outside world. But when I go to India and when I see some of those tribal peoples, how they worship, I see a great similarity between their worship and the worship of the traditional ancient people of Sri Lanka. Now I told you about the traditional people. What about the Buddhists who are the majority of this country? They too have worship programs that they have at nights and in some of those religious performances they also have a fire lit and people dancing around it with heavy drum beats and a lot of chanting and I see a similarity between those and that of the ancient peoples of Sri Lanka. Then when I see the ancient peoples of India, I see a similar thing. Then when I go to Africa, oh boy, such a huge continent with so many diverse people groups. But there is a striking similarity in the way they worship between each other they have they, 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 it's so similar that you would wonder if you if you participate in their religious ceremonies you you would think well this is all the same because they look so alike then when i go to the united states and canada and when i come across the native americans who we call red indians why? Because Christopher Columbus went there and on his way to India, he went on the other side and then he landed in the Americas and then he saw the, the Native Americans and he, he thought that they, he saw Indians. So when I go to uh, America and when I speak to the Native Americans, I tell them, you are false Indians and we are the real Indians, right? Now, Navajos, Apaches, Zunis um, and all these... Uh, Native American tribes which are different to each other in their language, religion, culture, philosophy, their, their, their way of life, everything. There is a striking similarity between each other when it comes to the religious activity at night. All of them have a fire lit up and they dance around the fire chanting with heavy drum beats with the medicine man preceding uh, the, 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 the great uh, religious performances. And then when I go to Australia, I find the same thing with the aborigines there. The night worship with fire lit, just like the Amauris in New Zealand. So, I want every one of you who is watching this program to sit back and think how could the native people living in, in the Americas and then those who live in Australia and those who live in New Zealand and those who live in Africa and those who live in India and those who live in Sri Lanka and I didn't uh, mention some of the other countries like Mongolia, China and Japan which are far towards the eastern part of the world. How in the world did they get a similar idea to worship? At night with a fire lit, heavy drum beats, chanting with a main religious figure like a medicine man. How? Well, my dear friends, the secret is Babylon. Babylon. And today, I'm going to be teaching about Babylon. Let me explain to you something that we find in the Bible. Genesis chapter 11 says this. You can read it and find out. I'll just, I'll just relate it. I'll just say it. 
when the people began to gather together and when they began to erect a huge moni no monument for themselves, for their own name's sake, God the Lord came down and he, he dispersed the language of those people. Because why don't we just go to uh, Genesis chapter 11 and we'll read, the, I'll read for you. Verse 1. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shina or Shinach and settled there. Shinach, it's none other than where the first ever civilization started. Well, in your schools, in the social studies, you would have learned that the first civilization was Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia means the civilization between two rivers. And the rivers were Euphrates and Tigris. So the first ever civilization known to mankind was in Mesopotamia, which was Shinach, another name was Babylon. So Babylonia was the place where people first gathered to create a civilization. The Bible goes on to say like this in verse 3. They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. My dear friends, when God created Adam and Eve, he told them, you increase and multiply and replenish the earth. Fill the earth. I have created for you an earth. So go, enjoy the entire earth. And then, we know that uh, a few centuries later, the great deluge happened during the time of Noah. And only Noah, his wife, and the three sons of Noah and their wives, totally eight people remained after the flood. And God told them, now you better increase and multiply and replenish the earth. God said, God said you go, go all over the world and, and just multiply, increase. I have created this earth for you. But here we see that these people decide to disobey that command deliberately. They say, we will not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. So that was a great disobedience to God's direct command. And they are saying here, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. The element of pride, the element of being together and create for themselves a great name over against giving the glory to God over and above the glory that, that is deserved only by God. Now my dear friends, when we read the Bible, we need to study the history also. And when I did a lot of deep research about Genesis chapter 11 and some of the preceding and the proceeding chapters, I can historically prove to you that there was a man who was actually instigating this. A man who was the mastermind behind this. His name was Gilgamesh. His name was Gilgamesh. Historically, Gilgamesh is the first ever king on earth. 
Now before the flood, between the time of Adam and Noah, there was no king on this earth. Okay. And after Noah, kingdoms appeared. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about that in a, in a minute. But the very first king was the guy called Gilgamesh. The Bible talks about him with a different name and I'll come to that in a little while. Gilgamesh was a king who manipulated the people so much. He duped the people with some theology and he made them not to scatter but to stay in one place which is now Babylon. We know as Babylon and build this huge tower for to, to, to actually make a and that was a woman called Semiramis. Gilgamesh's mother was Semiramis. And Gilgamesh claimed that he was God and his mother was a mother God and that the divine appointment is that he, although was a true son of Semiramis must marry Semiramis. So Gilgamesh married his own mother called Semiramis and to them was born Tammuz. In the Bible, in Jeremiah 7.18 and Jeremiah 44.25 you will see the queen of heaven and that's none other than Semiramis. Now my dear friends, I want to explain some of the ideas of that ancient Babylonia in other parts of the world, in other religions. And I have written some of these things down and I'm going to show them to you. I'm going to explain them to you. The father god and the mother goddess and the son god. The father God always remains Gilgamesh and the mother and the son. I'll explain. In Japan, in the Mahayana Buddhism of the Japanese Buddhist religion, the mother is San Pao Fu. San Pao Fu. Okay. Now that mother goddess is in three parts. Sun, not S-U-N, Sun. S-A-N, Sun. Sun. Now, I, since I don't know Japanese, my pronunciation may be uh, crooked, but it's like Sun, Sun, S-A-N. The second part is Pao. The third part is Fu. So, Sun, Pao, Fu is the Japanese religious counterpart of the real trinity of Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. Where did they get the idea from? Babylon. Gilgamesh did not just introduce a, 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 a God and his son but also he introduced the mother and brought the three in one ideology. Why? As I said earlier, the devil was the archangel and he, although he may not have understood it, he saw the trinity. He knew that Father, Son and the Holy Spirit are three persons yet one God. Even just like all of us, the devil did not understand how the trinity functions. But he knew that the trinity existed. Although the word Trinity is not found in the Bible and although Augustine of Hippo suggested the idea of Trinity first, the devil knew when he was the archangel that there was the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit in heaven. Maybe he didn't understand it. But he always wanted to counterfeit everything God did because he's a master counterfeiter. So how did he do that? He manipulated Gilgamesh to claim that he was the father God 
and he brought in his own mother as his wife. So Semiramis became the mother element and then to them was born the son of God, Tammuz. And then when it went to, when that ideology went to uh, Japan, it was San Pao Fu. Now in Egypt, it was like this. The son God was Pharaoh usually. And the father God was happy, the Nile River. And the mother goddess was Ra, the sun. In Babylonia, Ra was the sun, but it was masculine. In Egypt, it was feminine. Let me give two other names, perhaps you are familiar with. Okay? I said happy and Ra, but you may, you may, you may recognize the names Isis or Isis and Osiris. In America, it's Isis, spelt I-S-I-S. In other parts of the English speaking world, they pronounce it Isis. Isis of Egypt and Osiris. Isis is the mother and Osiris is the son. And in India, Isi is the mother and Ishwara is the son. In Asia, Sibel, Sibel is the mother, Dioyas is the son. Well, I know I'm not showing you anything in writing, but since this is a recording, unless you are watching on television or something, uh, you always can rewind and note these names and just, just Google it up. And you will see the historical information about uh, these that I am talking about. And then in Rome, it was Fortuna and Jupiter Puer. Fortuna. Fortuna in, in the Roman religion is none other than the Venus. That's the mother goddess. Fortuna, Venus. It's feminine. And Jupiter, Jupiter Peor, the, the Jupiter sun. Peor means Sun in the in in, in the uh, puer I think some people pronounce it puer I don't know Latin I don't know the Roman language so I think it it's pronounced puer so that 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 means Jupiter Sun now also now in Greece it was Irene and Plutus Irene the mother and Plutus and also in Greece the same Irene and Plutus had two other names. Irene had a name called Aphrodite. Aphrodite. Some people call it Aphrodite. Fine, Aphrodite. And Plutus, the sun god, is called Eros. You know the Greek word for Eros is also conjugal love, sexual love. Erotic, you know the word erotic, Eros. And therefore they believe that sun, Irene's sun, the sun god, is a god of fertil fertility. He's a fertility god. And therefore he's very much involved in sex. So that's how the term uh, Eros came. And in China, Xing Mu is the holy mother. Xing Mu. And Xing Mu's child is the son of God. They don't have uh, the names mentioned there. Okay, now all this came from Gilgamesh, I said. Now, who was Gilgamesh? That's the question, my dear friends. In the Bible, he is called Nimrod. Nimrod means hunter before God. Okay? It comes from a word Ninus in the ancient Akkadian which also means husband and father because he was both a husband and a father. Husband to his own mother and father to his mother's son, Tammuz. Now my dear friends, let's go to Genesis chapter 10 and I'm going to explain, I'm going to show certain things. 
Let's read uh, Genesis chapter 10. Verse 7. Let's read from verse 6. The sons of Ham, Cush and Mizraim and Phut and Canaan. Who was Ham? We know Ham was one of the sons of Noah. And Ham did a very bad uh, thing. When we look at chapter 9, we will see in verse 22. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. My dear friends, once they came out of the ark, Noah uh, cultivated uh, grapes, a vineyard, and he drank some of it and he was intoxicated. He was lying there uh, intoxicated. And Ham, one of the sons, the, the other two being uh, Japheth and uh, Shem, Ham went and saw the nakedness of his father. Saw the nakedness. Vayach ehwat. The Hebrew expressions. Vayach. Ehwat means having sexual relationship. Now we know that in the Bible, uh, the Hebrew language is sometimes very polite. Some other times it's very, very open, blunt. But uh, most of the time it's, it's polite. Adam knew his wife and she begat Cain. Now there, Adam knew that the word knew uh, is very polite. It's a nice way of saying that Adam had sexual intercourse with his wife. Now that's the Hebrew language. Now, a, a, a way of saying that they had illicit sexual relationship was vayach. Ehwat, meaning saw the nakedness. If you look at Leviticus and even Exodus, when God explained his people, to his people through Moses, who should not have illicit sex with some, somebody else, there Moses is told to say to the people, don't do this because if you do this, you are seeing the nakedness of your father or your brother, something like that. If you, if you have sexual intercourse with your father's wife, who is not your mother, but, but your father's wife, then you are seeing the nakedness of your father. Why what? And that's not good. It's not a good way of, uh, it, it's not a way of saying, yeah, that's a good kind of sex. No, that's illicit, that's immoral. And here, Ham goes and via Ehwat with Noah. So those two words tell us that he went and had sex with his father. The first recorded homosexual act is this. I come from Sri Lanka. And I don't care if this program is aired in countries where homosexuality is accepted. I am saying homosexuality is a sin. It doesn't matter. We have to love the homosexuals. But the homosexuality in them is a sin. They need to come out of that. They can't say I'm born like this and therefore I'll be like this. No. God forbids people from having sex with the same sex. Right? That's, that's why Sodom and Gomorrah were judged. That's why we still have a name called Sodomy for homosexual acts. The first recorded homosexual act was committed by Ham, the son of Noah, with his father. And he came and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders. Then they walked in backward and covered their father's nakedness. Their faces 
were turned the other way so that they would not see their father's nakedness. Now many people who just read the English Bible think that Noah was after booze. He was drunk and he was just lying on the floor and perhaps his raiment were, was a little bit here and there and Ham comes in and then he sees his father's nakedness. But he doesn't do anything. He doesn't cover the father. He just comes out and says that to his brothers. And they, without looking at the father's nakedness, they bring a sheet and put it over him. That's not how it is. There's another Hebrew word. Achasanit. Achasanit means backward, walking backward. Meaning not doing what the other guy did. Shem and Japheth did not do what Ham did. In other words, Shem and Japheth did not commit sexual intercourse, homosexual intercourse with their father, but they covered it up. In other words, they did not tell that to any other. And when Noah woke from his wine, verse 24, and found out what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will be, will he be to his brothers. Who was Canaan? Now we are going to see who Canaan was. But Canaan was not uh, Noah's son. He was Ham's son. If you read chapter 10 verse 6, the sons of Ham, Cush, Miriam, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Now why did Noah curse Canaan instead of Ham for what Ham did? You know, if, if Ham was cursed, it's a mild curse. But if his son was cursed, the entire generation is cursed. So, Noah was so terribly upset. He wanted to curse the entire generation of Ham. And the person called Nimrod comes from that cursed tribe. Let's go to the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10. And I'm going to read to you from verse 6 onwards. The sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Phut and Canaan. The sons of Cush, Sheba, Havila, Savta, Rama and Savteka. The sons of Rama, Sheva and Dedan. When you look at verse 7, the sons of Cush are listed there. But one person is not listed. He is listed in the next verse. Verse 8, Cush was the father of Nimrod. Okay, if you look at verse 7, Cush had several sons, Seva, Havila, Savta, Rama, and Savteka. Five. But there is an unlisted son who is listed in the following verse. Verse 8. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who grew to be a mighty warrior on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. Now this Nimrod is the guy who I said was Gilgamesh. The real name of him was Gilgamesh. Nimrod is a descriptive noun indicating that he was a very fine hunter. He was a hunter before God. It goes on to say, he was the mighty hunter. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That is why it is said like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The first centers of his kingdom were Babylon. Look, the first time the Bible talks about a kingdom was here. Although there were so many other people who are mentioned, the first person to have a kingdom was Nimrod. That's why I said Gilgamesh was the first king of the earth. His kingdom were Babylon, 
Echek, Akad, and Kalne in Shinach. All these were in Shinach. The, the, the English expression is Shina. Some people say Shina. Not China, Shina. Shina. And this Shina is none other than Babylonia, Mesopotamia. From that land he went to Assyria where he built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ech, Kala and Resen, which is between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. Do you understand my dear friend what I am trying to say here? The first time the Bible talks about a kingdom was in Genesis 10. And the first king in that kingdom was Nimrod. Because it says that his kingdom was in that region. And his real name was Gilgamesh. We have ancient Babylonian records to substantiate this. The first Babylonian kingdom was instigated, inaugurated by Gilgamesh, who in the Bible is called Nimrod. And even after the Tower of Babel incident where people were scattered to all parts of the world, Babylon remained as a great nation. That's why Hammurabi came and introduced the law to the world. And many centuries later, we see that Nebuchadnezzar II was one of the powerful kings of Babylonia. But after his time, Babylon began to fall. And during the time of his grandson, Belshazzar, the kingdom fell into the hands of the Medes and the Persians. And historically, Babylon ceased to exist. Today, Babylon is a small village town 120 kilometers south of Baghdad in Iraq. Now my dear friends I'll explain certain things about Babylon. When Satan fell he wanted to choose a capital for himself in the world and he chose Babylonia as his capital and the very first king who ruled the earth Gilgamesh was a slave of Satan. He was the one who Satan used to introduce idolatry to the world and the first idol built was the Tower of Babel. The first idol built was the Tower of Babel. Do you know the meaning of Babel? Gate to heaven. Haha, <laughs> does that ring a bell to you? Who said I am the door? Jesus. The original came many centuries later. And the counterfeit comes in Genesis 11 itself. Gate to heaven. So Gilgamesh called his people. Let's not scatter to every part of the earth. Let's remain here. Look at the beautiful two rivers and this is lovely. Let's stay here. And I am your God. And my mother is the mother God. And I marry my mother and we have a son, Thomas, that's the son of God. Hey, you know what? Semiramis was Cush's wife. He was, he was the wife. She was the wife of Cush. The father of Nimrod. And after begetting five sons, six inclu including Gilgamesh, to Cush, Semiramis, the evil, evil demon possessed woman, marries her own son. What an evil woman she was. How could she do that? Only because. Satan came into her. She was possessed. Now, I believe she was the first demon possessed person. 
You know, when I talk about Semiramis, I get really angry. And after that, the sexual immorality, look at the sexual immorality. The mother marrying the own son. But they want to show themselves as gods. That is why in some religions, you have immoral gods. A god should look moral. Hey, come on, let's come to our senses now. Any religion, if there is a religion in the world, east, west, anywhere, a religion is supposed to teach good things. Everybody knows that a good thing is, is this, this and this. A mother having sex with a son, a son having sex with the father, and the mother and son sleeping and having another son. You know, these are ugly, dirty. Even to a normal atheistic, agnostic mind, you don't need God to, to know these peripheral things. You don't need a religion to teach you these simple things. These are common sense. Only animals don't know that. If you watch this animal planet, then you will see how animals mate with any, as long as it's another, uh, it, it belongs to the opposite sex, they'll mate, not humans. But this woman, Semiramis, was able to marry her own son because she was possessed by the devil. Name for themselves. And Gilgamesh made the people worship him as a god, spelt with a simple G. Okay? I'll come to Gilgamesh in a minute. But let me explain what happened here. Verse 8 of chapter 11 says, So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. Verse 7 says, God decided, come let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. My dear friends, God wanted to put a stop to this tomfoolery. Why do I call it a tomfoolery? It was an utter foolish thing that they were trying to do. Now in Sunday schools and in some uh, Bible lessons, I have heard people teach that these people tried to build this tower to reach the heavens and God was so upset so God came down to stop it. No, no, no. Now we are living in a rocket age, right? We are sending rockets and we are actually tonight, in, 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 in exactly one hour, India is sending one of its rockets, uh, HSLV, to, to, the, to the orbit. So we are living in a time when our machines fly into the orbit. How could somebody build a building that would go beyond the atmosphere into the heavens? That, that's not why God was upset. God was upset because these people were not obeying him in replenishing the earth, going and occupying the entire world, but staying in one place to have a name for themselves and a fame for themselves, instead of giving God the glory, they were attracting glory to themselves. And there was this one man called Gilgamesh who was playing God here. I'll come to that later. Now, when God scattered the language of these people, they could not communicate with each other, so they left the others and they just went. They went to different parts of the world. Let me explain to you. Some people went to the Egyptian area where the river Nile is. That became the Nile River civilization. Some people went to the European area and they occupied land along the river Rhine which flows through Holland, Germany and Switzerland, the Rhine River. So we have a, a, a historical group of people, the Aryans, who were occupying the Rhine River civilization. 
then people went even to the far eastern regions of china and japan and also to india there was another great civilization which was in india india and pakistan the sindhu valley civilization where two great cities called mohenjadaro and harappa were erected and india which is the world's largest democracy stemmed from the mohenjadaro harappa sindhu valley civilization and people also fled across oceans don't ask me how i don't know nobody knows but somehow people managed to reach australia new zealand the americas now we know amerigo vespasi went to uh, america we know christopher columbus went to america but when amerigo vespasi and christopher columbus went to america they already saw people living there and i don't know how nobody knows how people went there but we know when that happened that happened in genesis chapter 11 when god confused the tongues of the people they fled from each other they were scattered and they went and occupied almost all the regions of the earth their tongues were confused not their religion that's the secret of babylon my dear friends yes god confused their tongues but not their religion religion played a very important role in the ancient babylonian civilization the world's first civilization of genesis chapter 11 and that was where they had the fire lit up at night and they were dancing around the fire with a main religious personality running the show with heavy drums beating and people chanting and you know these sort of paraphernalia happened in babylon so when people went to all parts of the world they took with them the babylonian religion and what we find in them is the great striking similarity of the way they worship their theology is the same the amauri theology the aborigine theology of australia the native american theology the indian theology the sri lankan theology the, the chinese theology everything is the same the only difference would be the language why god scattered disturbed confused their language so the same theology became known in different languages the the main the 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 great religious personality was called in different names in different cultures okay but the 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 main theology remains the same now what does that tell you it tells you that in the whole world the greatest existing religion is the babylonian religion statistically speaking the world the world's largest religion is christianity the second largest religion is islam and some of the great religions are the hindu religion the buddhist religion and there are some other religions and now in the western world the new age religion is gaining momentum but i'll tell you something what the statistics doesn't tell you is that the world's largest religion is the babylonian religion found in every country of the world the diff, the, the only only subtlety is that the same babylonian religion 
has different names, different methodology, different practice, but the essence, the substance of the faith is the same, which stems from Babylonia, Gilgamesh's religion, from the Tower of Babel. Doesn't that tell you something, my dear friends? I'll tell you, as Christians, since this is a Christian study, Babylon was the first nation to exist as a kingdom, ruled by a king called Gilgamesh. And, and Babylon, then even after people scattered to all over the world, those who remained in Babylonia were the strongest group of people. There were some very famous kings. There was a king called Hammurabi. King Hammurabi of Babylonia was the first king to introduce law to the world. Hammurabi's law was the first law to be ever written. Now that's why when Moses was called by God and when God told Moses to write the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, people argue, scholars argue that Moses borrowed the idea from Babylonia because the Hammurabi, the law of Hammurabi of Babylonia pre-existed the Mosaic Decalogue. And that's true. Moses wrote the Ten Commandments after Hammurabi of Babylonia introduced a law to the world. And even today, many nations of the world have borrowed ideas from Hammurabi's law. Okay? But I have an explanation for that, my dear friends. When the devil fell and became the devil, he lost his position in heaven. But prior to falling, he was an angel of God. He was not just an angel, he was the archangel. And as the archangel, he knew his theology well. He knew God's ideas. He knew God's laws. And he, after he fell, he knew that sooner or later, God would introduce his laws to his people. So long before God did that, he introduced the law as he knew it from the time he was in heaven through a very powerful king of Babylonia called Hammurabi so that when the original comes, the original will look like a duplicate. I'll give a wonderful example to you, my dear friends. Now, I don't know from where you are viewing this. You may be viewing this from uh, Europe or America. Then you wouldn't understand what I say. Now, now, in no discriminative opinions about any country, I'm just telling you what is happening in Sri Lanka. You know, most of our vehicles come from Japan. Japanese vehicles come to Sri Lanka. Toyota, Nissan... Mazda and all these, you know, a lot of Japanese vehicles come. Now, before the Japanese people send us spare parts, Taiwan makes the spare parts. So in Sri Lanka, when we buy an American, uh, sorry, a, a Japanese vehicle and we need a spare part, when we go to buy a Japanese spare part, it's not still available. It will come later, they will say. If it is available, it will be very expensive. But Taiwan would build the spare parts and they would send to Sri Lanka. So we can obtain Taiwan parts quickly and at a cheap rate. Now this is the trick of the devil when it comes to spiritual matters. Because he has been, the devil has been in heaven as an archangel. He knows a lot. He knows a lot about heaven. So he 
upon guessing that God would one day bring the original, he would introduce a duplicate before the original comes so that by the time the original comes, the original will look like a duplicate. The code of Hammurabi is actually a duplicate of the Decalogue. But the Decalogue came way after the code of Hammurabi. Okay, now that is not only with the law, but also with another thing. I'll explain to you. Gilgamesh had a son. His name was Tammuz. And Gilgamesh called his son Tammuz with a Babylonian Akkadian letter T like this, looking like a cross. Or, or the simple T in English. Or the letter Tau in Greek. Now, Gilgamesh said that his son Tammuz died and rose again from the dead. And he made the people believe that this truly transpired. So the ancient Babylonian people began to revel at the idea that Tammuz died and rose again from the dead. So the very first king of the earth, okay, called Gilgamesh, introduced the idea of God's son or the son of God dying and coming back to life. And many years later came the real son of God, Jesus. And when the real son of God died and rose again, it was very easy for the devil to deceive the intelligent world by saying, the idea of Christians was is not an authentic idea. Jesus did not truly come back to life, but they borrowed the idea from ancient Babylonia. Because the Son God, the, 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 the Son of God dying and coming back to life has existed for thousands of years. Can you see that? Can you see the deception? So that's what we see in the Babylonian religion. Now, Gilgamesh was the father god and his son Tammuz was the sun god. But they also had an idea of an evil trinity so they added another person. Why? Because the devil wanted a capital for himself on the earth. And he chose the first civilization of humankind, Mesopotamia, Babylonia. And he introduced the first idol worship called Babel. And Babel means, of course, you know, there is a Hebrew meaning also, confused. But Hebrew came much later. The real Akkadian meaning of Babel is the gate to heaven. Jesus said, I am the gate, I am the door. And only through me can you go to heaven. Only through me you can come to the Father. And Jesus came just 2000 years ago. But about 4500 years ago, the counterfeit son of God came. And the counterfeit gate to heaven came. No wonder God was mad. No wonder he disturbed their tongues. Now, this gate of heaven idea was taken back to all these nations where these people scattered from Babel. That's why wherever you go and see a religion, you will find the theology of going to heaven through a gate. Whatever that gate may be, a person, an object, a religious rite or performances, sacrifice, whatever. The idea came from Babylon. And the usual, as I said, the drum playing and all that kind of stuff. I'll tell you something else. 
historically speaking people believe that when the Medes and the Persians got together and conquered Babylon during the time of Belshazzar in 536 BC that the history of Babylon ended no my dear friends it never ended Babylon exists even today in two ways literally as Babylon in I Iraq and in a very subtle manner all over the world in many forms and fashions to which I'll come in a minute you know let's talk about the literal Babylon in 1991 when George Bush Sr. was the President of the United States of America. Iraq or Iraq under the leadership of Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and George Bush Sr. declared war against Iraq under the codename Operation Desert Storm. And most of us still remember how we saw live as to how the, the Iraq was attacked, how the Iraqian Scud missiles were uh, coming to attack and how the American Patriarch mis missiles intercepted the Scud missiles. We all remember those. How many millions of bombs fell on Iraq? Not a single bomb fell on Babylon. Not a single damage was witnessed in Babylon. Yes, Babylon was not a very significant prime point. It was not a huge city but a small village. Nonetheless, not even accidentally did a single bomb fall on Babylon. Many years later, George Bush Sr.'s son, George Bush Jr., waged a little war against Iraq and his code name was Operation Desert Fox. Even in that, no bomb fell on the physical Babylon. Can you believe this? I believe the devil was protecting his headquarters. Let me give you some of the other historical facts. In 1979, Saddam Hussein became the leader of Iraq because his party called the Ba'ath Party became the ruling party. And from 1979, Saddam Hussein began to rebuild Babel, Babylon. Again, I'll let you know that Babylon was and still is 120 kilometers south of Baghdad. And he started to build Babylon in 1979. And he opened Babylon officially in August 1986. From August 1986, they began to celebrate the Babylon festival in Babylon every August. And if you, you wouldn't believe, Iraq is a Muslim country. Even during the time of Saddam Hussein, they were all Muslims. You know the Muslims don't like idol worship. They don't like ancient religions. But every year in August, when under the leadership of Saddam Hussein, when they celebrate the Babylonian festival, the soldiers walk bare feet with spears and dressed like the army of Nebuchadnezzar and they bring, they parade the Ishtar poles and the Babylonian idols and statues along Euphrates. Idol worship. Many Muslim countries did not like this. But Saddam Hussein was very adamant 
that this will continue to be performed. Why? Because he claimed that he was the successor of Nebuchadnezzar. He called himself the second Nebuchadnezzar. And as Nebuchadnezzar did, he also wanted to wipe Israel out. But unfortunately, he got wiped out. And Israel still remains a nation. Praise God for that. So my dear friends, what we see is that Babylon is still there. The city of Babylon is still there. Untouched, not attacked. As small as it is, it is safe and it is still there. But now let's talk about the other side of Babylon. There are three Babylons that were introduced by Gilgamesh. The religious Babylon, the political Babylon and the commercial Babylon. Today my dear friends, the whole world is controlled by these three Babylons. Today Babylon is as active as in the days of Gilgamesh. Today Babylon is in every country, in every city, even in western cities, in the middle eastern cities. In eastern cities, in every continent, in every country, in some camouflaged term and name, the three Babylons exist. If you look at the economy of the world, the global economy is controlled by the same economical principles posed during the days of Gilgamesh, the Babylonian king. And that is what the world is finally coming to. Can you see Genesis chapter 11 where they say, let's not scatter, but let's come together. And now we are living in a scattered world. You get people almost everywhere. Even you go, you go to Amazon, you still find people, people groups that are not discovered. You go to Siberia, you go, you go to Greenland, you go to most hostile parts of the world, you still find people living, um, living in those areas. So we have a world where people are all scattered. And what is the world economy trying to do? bring everybody together economically under one economical banner. If you look at the history, you will see how they wanted to bring one currency and the world is coming to that now. A few years ago, the Euro dollar was introduced by the European Union. All the all all or more, most of the Schengen states today use the Euro. France, which used French francs, is using Euros now. Deutschland or Germany, which used Deutschmark, is using Euro now. And uh, Italy, which used Italian Lira, is using euros now. Belgium, which was using the Belgian franc, is using euro now. Holland is using euro now. Everywhere, the Schengen nations are beginning to use euro, the one currency. When euro was introduced, it was way lower than the dollar. But now, it has overtaken the United States dollar, US dollar, and it, has, it is now about 50% more, 50 or 60% much more valuable than the US dollar. So, this one world currency is very attractive. Great Britain, which always had, not only Great Britain, the United Kingdom, 
which had the sterling pound. They are forced by the European Union to change to the euro dollar. But, the, but, but Britain is saying no, already Southern Ireland has got euro into there. So now England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, they are persuaded by the European Union to bring the euro dollar into their system. Switzerland has become a Schengen state for, for, for the past three years. And the European Union is forcing the, Scheng, the, the Swiss, Swiss government to do away with Swiss francs and come to euro dollar. These nations are now wanting to use the same currency. But even before the euro dollar was introduced, after the second world war, slowly the United States dollar began to rise to become a universal currency. And today my dear friends, it doesn't matter where you go, you can change a US dollar. You, if you have US dollars, you can go to any part of the world and just change it in any small or big bank or the black market in a gold shop or, or in the market money change anywhere. This global one world economy, that's the Babylonian idea of the, the one world economy. And then slowly the world began to see the World Trade Center. You know, prices of many things are determined by a governing body. No longer by the producers of those products, but the governing body. If you look at world economics, everything is coming together. No, now people are studying the same format of business administration. And now Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, United States, Canada, all these nations which had their own ideas of economics are blending and emerging to introduce the common business administration programs. So now slowly but surely if you get your master of business administration in this country you still can operate in many other countries. Why? Because the, the same globalization of economics is coming back like during the days of Gilgamesh. That's the commercial Babylon. What about the political Babylon? Again, politically, they wanted to be under one king. They wanted to be under one rule. And today the world is yearning for that. The world is yearning and longing to have the one world government. And that's why, you know, in the early 20th century, the League of Nations was formed after the First World War. But after a few years, Japan pulled out from the League of Nations. The League of Nations was a very attractive solution to the world's problem in the, in the 1920s. But Japan decided they are trying to poke their finger into our business. So we will pull out. So Japan pulled out because Japan was trying to dictate terms to China and trying to try to manipulate China and to capture China. And the League of Nations was not happy about that. And Japan pulled out. But when in 1939, the Second World War broke out. The League of Nations could not stop it. And the war raged from 1939 to 1945. And after 1945, after the, second, after the end of the Second World War, the world governments thought the League of Nations is no longer powerful. So a few years later, in 1948, they formed what we now know as the United Nations. 
slowly but surely many nations began to become members of the United Nations. United Nations began to introduce many global universal programs. The UNESCO, the UNICEF, the, the United Nations uh, uh, Monetary Mission. All these things began to intrude into many countries. The United State Nations War Machine, the UN Peace Keeping Force, began to enter into nations which had civil problems, civil wars. And now the world is yearning and longing to come under one rule, preferably under the rule of the United Nations. Well, of course, America, the North, North America did not like the idea. So they formed their own United Nations type thing. The NATO. North American Treaty Organization. But today, NATO and United Nations are working together. Slowly trying to emerge as a one force. So my dear friends, politically, Look at Europe. I remember the days. I remember the days when I used to go to Germany with a German visa. But in order to, since I had a, I, I had to travel by car from London. I had to go to Calais in, uh, in, in Paris and drive through Belgium and cross over to Germany through the Aachen border. And I had to go to London to the French embassy to obtain a visa to drive through France. And to the Belgian embassy to get the visa to drive through Belgium. I couldn't go to Holland without, without a Dutch visa. I remember the day when we tried to explain to the border people, can we just go in to see Switzerland from the from uh, the Basel border in Germany. And the Swiss authorities said, no, go back. But you know what? Today, all these nations have opened their borders because they all have become sort of one nation under the title Schengen. And now, all I have to do is to get either a French visa, a Belgian visa, an Italian visa, a Swiss visa, a Norwegian visa, a Denmark visa, a, a, a German visa, an Austrian visa, one of the Schengen visas, and go to all these countries without any border problems. What's happening? Nations are opening up borders to other nations and they are becoming one. So most of these nations where the borders are open now share the same currency. In my lifetime itself I am seeing how the political unity is coming together. You know, In the world's history it is after the 20th century that we are seeing heads of nations coming to one place to meet and to vote. And today that's happening in United Nations. So my dear friends, we are seeing not only a commercial Babylon re-emerging, but a political Babylon re-emerging. What about the religious Babylon? I already started this teaching by saying that in every religion, you get the Babylonian element but what about the doctrines? Friends, now, the religion of Babylon is entering into all religions. Religions are finding the common standpoint, the common grounds to be equal. Peace between religions. I'm, I'm not... 
I'm not in any way suggesting that religions should fight. Well, I don't believe in people fighting for ethnic reasons, religious reasons, commercial reasons, reasons of race and creed and nationality. No, 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 I'm not for it. Because I live in Sri Lanka where we had enough of ethnic problems, battles and wars and killings and murders and how religious feuds and ethnic feuds killed so many people. I have had enough. I have been a victim of ethnic feud and religious feud. What I'm saying is, there's a false kind of unity between religions nowadays. On that note, I would like to narrow my teaching to talk about the church. Yes, we have spoken about the world. Now let's leave the world aside. What is happening in the churches today? My dear friends, many churches are infiltrated by the spirit of Babylon. The, the religious Babylon, the political Babylon, and the spiritual Babylon are all coming into the church in a very powerful way. Officially and unofficially. Historically, my dear friends, in 314 AD, when Emperor Constantine appointed Sylvester as the, the patriarch or the pope of Rome. He was called Pontifex Maximus. Pontifex Maximus. Making bridge maker. The, the, the expression Pontifex was the same title given to the Babylonian priests during the time of Gilgamesh. So, the Gilgamesh priesthood, the Babylonian ancient Babylonian priesthood came back to the Christian church in 314 AD. In 312 AD, until 312 AD, Christianity was a suppressed faith, faith, persecuted by any and everybody. You remember, if you look at the Acts of the Apostles, the first martyr was Stephen. And then when you look at, at Acts, you will see how people were persecuted. During the time of Paul, a gr great emperor came in Rome called Nero. And it was Nero who, who torched Rome and put the blame on Christians and he burnt so many Christians live um, along the Colosseum and some amphitheaters to run the circuses at night. And it was Nero who beheaded Paul. And then came Caligula, Vespasian and many other Roman rulers. Christianity was an underground faith until 312 AD when Constantine had a war between him and Maxim, Maxentius near the Milvian Bridge. He claims, Constantine claims that he saw a vision of a cross and the words by this sign you conquer. And he won the war and his mother Helena told him it's all because of Jesus who she was worshipping secretly. Constantine became a Christian. And in 313 AD the edict of toleration of Christians was passed. So Christians who, who were hitherto in, in the undergrounds hiding came to the surface. The next year, he appointed Sylvester, Constantine appointed Sylvester as the chieftain of all the pastors, all the uh, priests, Christian priests. And he was called Pontifus Maximus. 
the Babylonian religion came into Christianity as immediately as Christianity came to the surface from being an underground church. Now my dear friends, in today's churches, three things are found. The three Babylons are evident. In whatever order, I'll just tell you the way I am getting it in my mind. The religious Babylon is found in our churches today. The good, lovely worship is giving way to those bang, bang, do -go, do -go, do -go, do -go, drum beat of Babylonia. For those of you who don't know me, I used to be a professional musician in Sri Lanka. And I gave that up to become a Christian. I love music. I love any kind of music. But we need to be very careful what type of music we are using to worship God. Some of the musics are demonic. Why? Because they came from ancient Babylonia. I am in no way against loud music. Because I believe in Psalm 150 where it says, you worship the Lord with crash cymbals and you know. Soft music, lovely. Loud music, lovely. It doesn't matter. And I believe that we can use any and every instrument. But the Babylonian religious chanting is now coming into the churches. Dug, 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 dug. Jesus, 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 Jesus. You know, that's none other than the Babylonian chanting Christianized. And I have seen in many Christian programs how, you know, this chanting occurs. The only thing is they are Christianized. It's, it's God, it's Jesus they are, they, they are saying. Uh, but, but, but when they do it, you know, the way they do it and the way they play the music and, you know, it's, it, it really brings back the spirit of Babylon into the religion. One must be very careful, very careful as to what sort of music we are introducing into our Christian worship. And I also see how the, the Pontifex Maximus idea is coming to many pastors. In the Babylonian religion, the, the priest was next to God. He was held very highly. He, he was actually the bridge maker, you know, between God and, I mean, Pontifex Maximus means bridge maker. So the Babylonian priests acted as people who would bring the populace to the God. So they were the reconcilers. My dear friends, if you are a Christian, I believe that you need a pastor to shepherd you, but not to play the role of a bridge maker. You don't need another person to bring you to God, unless, unless in a gospel preaching scenario, where you go to preach the gospel to somebody who, do, who doesn't know God, so you be the reconciler, like Malachi chapter 4 says in verse 6, that Elijah will come before the day of the Lord to reconcile the fathers with sons and sons with fathers. The ministry of reconciliation is given to the church as per Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 onwards, where Jesus says, you go into all nations and make disciples. How can we make disciples without reconciling them with God? So I believe in the ministry of reconciliation. I believe in the ministry of bridge building. I believe that the church acts as a bridge between God and the world where the, the people could go through the church to God. Fine, everything is fine. But the priest in, in today's Christianity, are 
becoming more powerful and powerful and powerful to become like a pontifex maximus of the Babylonian religion. I'll talk about India, Sri Lanka and the Tamil church of large. I'm a Tamil speaking Christian. When I came to, came to the ministry 27 years ago, it was very difficult for one to be ordained as a pastor. We had to go through Bible college for three years, minister under a pastor for two years. Then we received the ministry license to minister. And for five years, we have to be, we have to use that ministry license to prove that we finally can be ordained. And by the time we are ordained and we are allowed to serve communion and to conduct funeral services and to marry people, we have been in the ministry for over 10, 15 years. But today, my dear friends, you know, many people are just, they are receiving baptism four days ago and they are going to church three days ago and they are becoming pastors two days ago and then they become reverends one day ago and they become cardinals and what not today. So today in Pentecostal churches, I am a Christian Pentecostal charismatic guy. You know, even in the Pentecostal charismatic churches, now you find not just pastors, you'll find reverend, doctor, bishop, cardinal. And I believe in, in no time you'll suddenly see some popes in the, in the uh, Pentecostal church. Because... Pentecostal movement was born in 1900 on January 1st. Topeka, Kansas. And the Azusa Street Revival was the triggering factor for the, grow, for the momentum of the Pentecostal movement from Los Angeles. The Azusa Street Revival birthed the Church of God, the Assemblies of God, and some other lovely Pentecostal denominations. And in 1924, Pentecostalism came to my country, Sri Lanka. And I became a Christian in 1979. And I remember the good old days when pastors were shepherds. They were with people. They loved the people. They cared for the people. And the people loved the pastors. There was the mutual love and the understanding. The pastors were not the elite, unreachable, ooh, big shots. But today the tide is turning. Pastors are becoming more proud and proud from being humble servants of God. Remember when Jesus said about the leaders, he said... That if you are to be a leader, you need to be a servant. But from being servant leaders, today many pastors have become leaders like bosses. They're like the managers. They need to be respected. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing to command respect and quite another to demand respect. So today many leaders, spiritual leaders are demanding respect. They want their titles to be mentioned. I uh, I am invited uh, to a, a t Christian TV station uh, here in Sri Lanka where I go. And I am told by people that sometimes if you fail to put the title reverend or uh, doctor to some pastors who come to teach and to preach, they get so offended. Sometimes, you know, the leaders get offended when their titles are not used. On a, on a pamphlet, on a notice, on an advertisement. So, respect is something. Something else. But, you know, people wanting to become that pontiff type person. That's happening in Christian churches now. You know, people wanting leadership roles. People wanting to share the stage. People wanting to show their colors off 
you know, to have those lovely attractive business cards uh, like businessmen. So these things come from the Babylonian religion, the priests becoming more and more powerful and they start to shepherd heavily, heavy shepherd, heavy shepherding and things like that. Now there's another thing that today's churches are facing. The Babylonian rituals are coming into the churches now. You need to have a decent, orderly church functioning. Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, let everything be done in decency and in order. That's lovely. But this decency and order should not be confused with rituals. So many people, many churches and many Christians have become uh, ritualistic people. Now with a lot of people becoming Christians from other religions, the tendency is there to bring practices of other religions into Christianity and name them Christian. You know, since I came from another religion, an Eastern religion in Sri Lanka, I see this very much in our churches. Some religious things from other religions are brought into Christianity. The only difference is that they start with a prayer and they end with a prayer. So I tell people, can you murder somebody with a prayer? Oh Father, I pray that you would be with this murder. Help me to kill this person so mightily that this person will really die. And then after you kill, thank you Lord for your presence. You, you were there when I did that. Oh, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. No. Christian things are Christian things. Biblical things are biblical things. They need not, they should not be confused with rituals of other religions, other cultures. We need to be very careful. So, worship, the pastors, the leaders, and uh, ritual things, all these things need to be very carefully sieved and examined, examined lest the Babylonian religion enters the church. Next, we'll talk about politics. Let's talk about the political Babylon. The spirit of Babylon is entering churches and making them political enterprises than places of worship. Now, a lot of this politics have come into churches, hierarchy, you know, a lot of undercutting. These are happening in the churches now. Many people are jealous over others to come. Now, I have uh, participated in some annual general meetings of some denominations. Oh boy, when they want to elect a chairman, the politics that I see in these churches make me so sad and shocked. These are the people who became Christians forsaking the world. They said we don't want anything from the world. But now slowly the, the, the wanting to rule, wanting to govern, wanting to be in positions, leadership roles, you know, being on the pedestal, these things are slowly coming into the church nowadays. So one must be very careful that the political aspect of Babylon should not enter the church, should not be let to enter the church. One other thing that I see in the Babylonian political system in churches is the wanting to be in good books with others. You know, as we saw in Genesis chapter 11. Let's all be together. Let's all live together. This, let's understand each other. Let's accept each other. I see in churches today that they are accepting the sinner with the sin. Whereas Jesus accepted the sinner but rejected the sin. When the sinners were brought to him, he forgave them and said, don't do this again. And the churches once upon a time, let these sinners come in. 
but they help the sinners to get out of sin whereas today the trend is changing the babylonian politics is entering the churches and they are trying to say it's okay for you to come and to be what you are here because you are what you are so we understand you we love you so you can remain a homosexual and still worship the lord you can remain a lesbian and still come to the ministry you can remain a, a, a transsexual person and you can remain a liar you can remain these things and be a christian no my dear friends politics should be kept far from the church because christianity is not a democracy it's a kingdom ruled by king jesus melech yeshua king jesus we are not a democracy for the majority to suggest who to do what another sad thing that i am seeing in churches is that no longer can the holy spirit have the prerogative as to who he keeps in a church as a shepherd the congregation the eldership decides they decide the quorum decides it's by way of election that you choose the shepherd it's no longer the holy spirit but the the subtlety the trick is this let's pray and ask the holy spirit excuse me don't bring the babylonian religion into christianity and don't bring the babylonian politics into christianity and butter them up with christian prayer and bible reading what is babylonian is babylonian what is scriptural is scriptural one should run the church according to the scripture but i see the politics of babylon is entering the church in a very powerful way so accepting people another element of church politics is trying to be in good books of other religions other ethnic groups other people now did stephen try to do that in the book of acts no and therefore he was killed did paul try to do that did paul well he said within the context of the gospel i am a jew to the jew and i am a greek to the greek but he never compromised his faith with any other religion he didn't practice he didn't go and show himself as another religious person but he always remained a christian today many christians especially christian leaders are participating in other religious functions just because they are invited and in their church programs they are inviting other religious priests to come and occupy their stage to come and give a word of greeting once upon not too long ago there was this um independence day celebration in sri lanka and i was invited to be the speaker and when i went there sadly in that church it was a presbyterian church and i know how john knox started the presbyterian church amidst the persecution of queen mary up in scotland and here in sri lanka i went to a presbyterian church and they held the independence uh, uh, meeting here in candy and i saw that my seat was next to other religious priests seat i was one of the four religions that were representing on that day and i got really mad and i wanted to walk out what share do i have inside the church with other religious priests and the folks who came with me from my church they said but pastor this is a good opportunity for you to preach the gospel so i used my time to preach the gospel but i didn't want to stay and to have a cup of coffee with them i just walked out why because i could see the babylonian compromise there and we are seeing that on christian stages 
we see other religious personalities and on other religious stages we see Christian personalities and that's none other than Babylonian political compromise under the Christendom and thirdly the Babylonian commercial, like commercial things Babylonian economical styles have come into the church many Christians are now becoming businessmen many ministries are becoming business oriented ministries many programs are becoming business oriented programs let's talk about some of the Bible colleges which were started with the sole purpose of producing men and women of God into the ministry. But now, many of those institutions have become commerce-based, money-based, economy-based institution. And they are after the fees, and they are after the enterprise, they are after the building projects, they are after the money, they are after the profits. And what happens is the true vision dies off. Many powerful men of God started Bible colleges. Many powerful men of God started institutions, companies. Even many Christian businessmen performed their businesses for the extension of God's kingdom. But many people have entertained business into their enterprises. Many television programs, many television stations, Christian television stations started as stations that would promote the gospel with the intention of glorifying the name of God. And then slowly they would start telecasting programs by people who are able to pay and buy the time. So many Christian television organizations now are airing programs that are completely different to their own conviction, which are heretic in doctrine, confused in perspective, business in orientation, but they are on the television. They are on Christian televisions. So this money making enterprise is now gaining momentum. And many Christian singers, Christian musicians are producing albums not to worship the Lord, not to make people worship the Lord, but to make money and to build their enterprise. I'm not criticizing everyone here. I'm talking about some people. But sadly, these things are growing these things are growing. And what I see about this financial attraction in churches is that people who have money, people who have riches, people who have donated stuff to churches, they can come late, they can do anything, they can uh, dictate terms to the pastor, they can run the show, they, because they have money and they bring, bring a lot of tithes and a lot of offerings. They're just treating the church as a marketplace. Jesus cleansed the temple twice in his ministry. John chapter 2 says how after he performed his first miracle in Cana of Galilee, of turning water into wine. He went to Capernaum, stayed for a few days, and then he went to Jerusalem. There he cleansed the temple because that was becoming, that had become a place of commerce, a business place. Then according to Matthew chapter 21, after Jesus came to Jerusalem on the colt, after the triumphal entry, he went straight to the temple and he cleansed the temple. Within the three years, the temple had become a marketplace yet again. 
and today many Christian organizations, churches and Bible schools have become Christian marketplace, places, not the intended Christian places. So my dear friends, we need to be very careful as to the finances, the commercial side of things within Christianity. And now the real true Christian economics is suppressed. The true Christian economics is give and it shall be given unto you and bring the tithe into the storehouse. And many people are talking against tithes nowadays. Oh, that's an Old Testament ideology they'll say. The Old Testament began with Moses. Exodus 20. Whatever preceded Exodus 20 preceded the Old Testament. Genesis chapter 14 goes far beyond the Old Testament. It was way before the Old Covenant was established. And there Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek. And Jesus in the New Testament says, you should not stop giving tithes. So there are many teachings now that say that tithes belongs to the Old Testament. But truly tithes came before the Old Testament and it runs through after the Old Testament. And that Christian economics is suppressed for the entertainment of of Babylonian economics, the Babylonian commerce. And many people are doing fundraising and fundraising and fundraising for this, that and the other. And today many churches are seeing program after program after program to please people. Like business organizations running commercial programs. So, these th three things have come into the church. The religious Babylon, the political Babylon, and the commercial Babylon. But the good news is, my dear friends, in Revelation 17 and 18, these two chapters, Babylon is crushed. Finally, God puts an end to the religious Babylon, commercial Babylon, and the political Babylon. When you look at eschatology, when you look at the book of Revelation, you will see a person called the Antichrist. But if you have a very closer look, you will see three Antichrists. You will see the Antichrist, the political leader. Then you will see the prophet, false prophet, the religious re leader. And then you would see the beast, the commercial leader. So the political leader is the spirit of Babylon in the political arena. The spirit of political Babylon, the political antichrist will come in the last days. And then he will, accompanied, he will be accompanied by the religious antichrist who is the false prophet and both of them will have the commercial antichrist the beast but all these and three antichrists will be destroyed Babylon will be destroyed in Revelation 17 and 18 and God will put an end to Babylon okay my dear friends in this lesson I have explained to you who started Babylon and how from the time of Gilgamesh who was Nimrod how the spirit of Babylon has encroached into all spheres of life in the world and finally has entered the church too. I believe this teaching has blessed you in many ways. If you have any questions and queries, suggestions, additions, please let us know. Write to us, call us and let us know. And if there are things that we need to 
uh, correct by way of having new details, we are happy to do that. We are not dogmatic. We are not adamant that what we say are true. But we are willing to tell you that we have done a lot of research. I have done a lot of research to bring this teaching to you. And I believe the Holy Spirit will truly give you the understanding of Babylon and bless you and keep you from the spirit of Babylon, the spirit of the religious Babylon, the spirit of the political Babylon, and the spirit of the commercial Babylon. May God bless you richly. Amen.